Before we get into the final part of 11F, I needed to take this digression a little bit further into what I'm calling as a title of this audio, um, the Jewish fixation. It completely chaps me. People don't bother to think through anything. As a result, we've got, what, about what, 4,000 years a really stupid history of fixation on Jewishness. Okay? People don't bother to do their homework in the Bible to figure out where the whole concept of Jewishness derives. So they don't even understand what it means. And this is true on both sides of the aisle. The Gentiles are fixated on the Jews, and the Jews are fixated on the Jews. And nobody's going back to the beginning to understand what that even means. As a result of which, you have a bunch of loonies, just complete crazy people, on both sides of the question, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. And it's really very sickening. Nobody's looking at God and what God did and why God did it. They're all just, oh, I'm a Jew, oh, I'm a Gentile, all right? Or the Jews really ought to be replaced. We're the true Jews. It's insane. And everybody who's making an issue about Jewishness hates God. Because if you love God, then you don't care. You get to know Him, so everything else doesn't matter. So everybody making an issue about being a Jew or the Jews hates God. Period. Proof. Right here. Because if you love God, you love His Word. If you love God, you know His Word. And if you don't even bother to learn His Word, then you don't love God. And you're a big fat liar. Proof. Genesis fifteen six. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. Now that was the cover to the audio on F11, F2. Genesis 15. The video cover. The video cover to 11, F1 was Genesis 12. Anyone who blesses you, I will bless. Anyone who curses you, I will curse. Well, who is the word you? Abraham. Now you're cursing Abraham if you're cursing his progeny. But who is Abraham's progeny? Genesis 15, 6. Now Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account as righteousness. So if you've got one of Abraham's genes in you, you're his progeny. And that could be up to 50 to 75% of the world's population by now. Because the Middle East was a nexus of three continents. And there was a whole lot of rape and a whole lot of pillage and a whole lot of people carried off, women in particular, women and kids, who were carried off during all the raids that went on during the time that Israel was in the land and even before. Because remember, Abraham was born what was it, 2060 B.C.? I forget. It was 2046 from Adam that he was um, age 100. So in, in Bible years, it was 1946 years after Adam's fall that Abraham was born. Okay, and I'm, I'm just off the top of my head equating that with 2060 B.C., Now, it might be another year. I'd have to go look it up. That's a lot of years with a lot of kids. Because remember, he not only had, you know, sons through Isaac, who's the son of the promise. But the promise in Genesis 12 is based on progeny. Which means anybody who was a derivative of Abraham's genes. In other words, a son, a grandson, a great-grandson. And he had he had another wife after Sarah. Okay? 
And he had also had Ishmael. I think he had another wife after Sarah. I may be confusing him with Moses. But the point is, is that Abraham had two kids, Isaac and Ishmael. And then Ishmael had a lot of kids. They're considered the princely tribe among the Arabs today. Well, the Arabs are extremely prolific, and they're always big on rapine. So they've put their genes all over the place. Okay, and then Jacob was one of twin sons, Esau, through through Isaac, and all of the, the Edomites came through that, and there were a whole bunch of other tribes that came through that, because they all intermarried too. All right, and they spread their genes all over the place, because they were just, you know, they're, they're like rabbits. So for all you know, 50% of the world's population could each one person among 50% of the population could have Abraham's genes. So then the Genesis 12 covenant applies to how much of the human race by today. That's why it's so stupid to be anti-Semitic. And then you're also progeny of Abraham if you did what Abraham did, which is what the Lord kept on saying to the Pharisees in John 6 through John 8. And of course, Paul reiterates that in Romans 4 and in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and Galatians, the um, whole book of Galatians. And then, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Galatians, and Romans 10, especially Romans 10. So if you do what Abraham did, you're like a son of Abraham. It's circumcision of the heart. But it also has the racial component. All right, well, you know, like 50% by now, with all the, the begetting that's been done, it could be 50% of the world's population now because of all the travel and the fact that, that you know, Africa flows through, through you know, the landmass to Africa and Europe and Asia, all hooked through Israel. And Israel's been taken over so many times. There have been so many wars there. With all the traveling that people do, you could travel around the world in a year or two if you hug the coastlines, did it right. So, you know, how many people have some of Abraham's genes in them? And it would be just like God to do a thing like that. All right, so those are the two things about being Jewish. You're Jewish by bloodline or by faith. Well, if you believed in Christ, then you're a son of Abraham. That's the whole point of Galatians. The bondwoman and the free woman. Okay, well, you have two kinds of bondage. All right, now, i got to turn the fan on. It's too hot in here. So now think. Just, just think. Why did God pick Abraham? Abraham wasn't a Jew at birth. It was a race that was created by faith. Abraham believed in the Lord. He circumcised himself because that was the covenant that God made with Abraham. And then all of his kids. God created a new physical race based on Abraham. Now why did God do that? Because Messiah was the son of who is to come from Abraham's loins and deliver the human race by dying on the cross. So all of us who believe in Christ are, as it were, a son of Abraham because we did what Abraham did. So there is absolutely no basis whatsoever for anti-Semitism, period. It's the stupidest thing in the world. For all you know, you could be a Jew. You don't know if you are or not. Because in every diaspora and all the, the takeaways and the marauding that got done over the centuries, you know, out of every ten Jews who might have been caught in a, in a pogrom or who had to exit and go into exile over the centuries and centuries and centuries, well, maybe nine of them would pretend not to be Jewish. Okay? So they're going to be all over the place. Can't tell you how many Jews, when they came to the United States, changed their name. Now, it's a very common thing. You should be able to find it somewhere. You know, there's this big thing that goes on and periodically amongst Jews. 
you know, those who changed their names so that they couldn't be discovered as being Jewish when they came to the United States. And it's not only the United States where that practice was done. So, you know, hello. And one, in fact, one of the most common things that's, that's pretty well known is that a whole bunch of Mexicans are Jews. That was one of the exiling, you know, one of the big exoduses that happened. Is that they did that. A whole lot of Dutch Jews, a whole lot of Nordic Jews. You can't tell a Jew from a non-Jew by, by you know, genetics, by looking at them. By looking at them. Okay? Because there's every kind of bloodline is Jewish. I mean, literally, having the, the blood of Abraham in the veins. Every kind of, every kind of, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to call it outward, will have some of Abraham's genes in it. They're blonde Jews. Or David himself was a redhead, King David. So even back then, in 1000 BC, David was from the tribe of Judah. Okay, in other words, you know, it was what um, about 800 years at that point that the tribe of Judah had been around. And David was redhead. So you cannot look at somebody and say, oh, see, those that's what Jewish looks like. You can't tell that. There is a branch, a very prolific branch, of Jewish genes that has dark hair, dark eyes, the so-called, you know, prominent nose. But that's just one branch. And I don't even know what tribes you could say that is. Okay, because it's really more of a geographical, you know, group around the Mediterranean. There are a whole lot of people who aren't Jews or aren't considered Jews that have that same look about them. Just like, you know, a lot of people from India really are very different races. You know, India is made up of many different races. And the same thing is true of China. I mean, you know, there's some characters on TV that we ascribe and call them Chinese, but they're not Chinese. They're very famous actors who, who we say look like they're Chinese, and they have Chinese names, but their actual racial origin is not Chinese. Because China itself is made up of, I don't know, got to be 700 different dialects, and at least... I don't, I don't remember anymore, but at least, you know, be 10, 10, 20 different whole peoples that aren't Chinese. Same thing is true in India, same thing is true in Russia, same thing is true actually in Europe, except that the ethnic diversity isn't so great anymore. You see what I'm trying to get at? This whole business about being all obsessed over the Jews, you don't know if you're one. Now, there are a whole bunch of people who have, according to them, and I bet you they can't really prove it, oh, we're Jews, we go back all the way 4,000 years because they have manufactured their genealogies. Because you're supposed to do that. Now, how do you know your genealogical record is correct? You don't. I'm sorry. Now, Temple was the repository of the genealogical records, and when it got destroyed, honey, so were the records. So everybody trying to claim that they had their genealogical records right, well, they don't, and we know for sure that they don't, because when the exiles came back to, from Babylon to build the second temple, there were a whole bunch of people who considered themselves to be priests by what they remembered orally, but they couldn't prove it from the genealogical records, which means that the first time the temple went down, all those genealogical records went out too. So anybody manufacturing the idea that he's a Jew from X number of generations all the way back, well, you actually don't know. So what you do know is that you're claiming a Jewishness based on your culture. And according to the Bible, you're not a Jew if you never believed in Christ. Even if you are a Jew racially. And you don't really know if you're a Jew racially. So all the people who are claiming that they're Jews might not be. Now, I'm not sitting here trying to disparage Judaism 
or the Jews. You should know that by now. I made a lot of videos explaining how anti-Semitism is the stupidest thing you can get yourself into. But at the same time, it is akin to anti-Semitism to make a big stink about being Jewish. That's another one of Satan's tactics, is to make you get all hung up on, oh, I'm the son of Abraham. What did Christ say? God could take these stones and make them sons of Abraham. What did Paul say in Romans 11? They were grafted out and you were grafted in. Don't get all snotty about it. Or God will graft you out too. What did Moses say to the people just before he, you know, going into the land, which God wouldn't let him go into because he got ticked off at second Meribah and struck the rock, rock when he was supposed to speak to it? What did God have him say to the Jews just before they went into the land, just before he died? Don't get all pig-headed about the fact you're going into the land and taking over all these other people. Now that's the problem that a lot of people who call themselves Jews have. And there are a whole lot of people who, you know, as far as we can tell by our false idea of what Jewishness even is, the whole lot of people, you know, they go to shul. I mean, I was raised Jewish too. So I mean, I know a little bit about it. I wasn't always raised Jewish the whole time, but for some years, few. Sometime before I was 12, my recollection before I was 12 isn't very good. But I do remember some things. And being Jewish is a cultural thing. And it is handed down from father to son, but a lot of Jews rejected the culture. Now the culture and Judaism itself is a pretty, you know, obvious thing. If a guy is, you know, calls himself a Jew, well, for all you know, he is. But a lot of people make a big stink out of the fact that that's what they are. And in fact, it's a big stumbling block, just like the Bible says. Oh, I'm a Jew. My father was a Jew. My father's father was a Jew. We hate the Christians. Anything Christian, you know, because Christ is in that. Messiah is, you know, persona non grata. That you're not a good Jew and they'll hold what they call a get. That's Yiddish for divorce. If you believe in Christ. And to this day, in Israel, it is a law in Israel that you don't have the right of Aliyah, which means the right to return and claim yourself an Israeli citizen, because you can be an Israeli citizen simply if you're Jewish. You don't get the right of Aliyah if you believe in Christ. And people who are persona non grata in Israel are people who are Jews and they convert. They believe in Messiah. That is a, you know, a social restriction, not so much a government restriction. But you're, you're kind of a pariah in society, in Jewish society, if you believe in Christ. Because it's a cultural idea. And you can understand how that cultural idea got there. Because the Jews were pogromized by people who were all obsessed over what Jewishness was. Of course, that's satanically inspired. But it's also satanically inspired to make a big stink about, oh, I'm Jewish, I'm following the culture, I'm going to my mother, my father, my sister, my brother, I'm going to school, I'm going to shul, I'm studying Torah, I'm going to yeshiva. What do you think I learned the accent? I understand the mindset that that produces. You think you're holding your, your world, your people together because you observe the culture. And so you have to call the people who are observing the culture Jews. Because they consider themselves Jews. Whether they are or not, you don't know. And neither do they. That's the culture. And the Bible's definition is both racial and if you believe like Abraham did. Not if you observe the culture. But you don't know if the people observing the culture have Abraham's genes in them. 
So you have to regard them as Jews if they call themselves Jews. So you leave them alone. And if they call themselves Jews, that's their culture for all you know, and probably, because at least that's what history supports, God will defend them. In other words, somebody who's observing the Jewish culture, who calls himself Jew and thinks of himself as being racially Jewish, even if he's not, as far as he knows he is, he's observing the culture. He's observing tradition already. And so for, because that's the common idea of what Jewish is, God will defend them too. But there is no special in with God if you have Abraham's genes. There is no special in with God if you do what Abraham did. Anyone who believed in Christ is doing what Abraham did. Well, that's a whole bunch of people and they're all mostly apostate. Anybody with Abraham's genes who didn't do what Abraham did is under the protection clause of Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. But he didn't do what Abraham did, so Paul wrote Romans 9. There is a covenant that you get for just having Abraham's genes. That's not due to your good. You don't merit anything. You're not better than someone else if you have Abraham's genes. If I inherit something that somebody gives me, that reflects on the person giving it to me, not on me. If you inherited smart genes, then that reflects on the person who had the smart genes and passed them on to you, not on you. And 50% of the population could have at least one of Abraham's genes. Are you beginning to get the picture here? You're not better if you're Jewish, whether by race or by faith or by culture. You're not better if you're not Jewish, obviously. The Jews were given the law because the law was given to Moses because God promised Abraham that 400 years after Isaac was born, or actually it was a little longer than that, 14, we'll see, Isaac was born 13 years after Genesis 15. I think that was what it was. Maybe not. Maybe it was later. But four, 400 years after Isaac was born was the promise. No, not 400 years after Isaac was born. It was for 400 years the Jews would be in slavery. That's the exact legal language in Genesis. What is it, 15? For 400 years they would be in slavery. He didn't say when it would begin. We didn't time it from the birth of Isaac. 400 years. Started in 1870 B.C., Jacob entered the land, I mean entered Egypt. He was 130 years old at that time. Four generations and 400 years later, and because scholars can't read Exodus 6.20 properly, they screw it up. They're incompetent when it comes to plotting the Exodus. 400 years after uh, literally 430 years from the day that Jacob entered Egypt. That's what uh, Exodus 12, 40 through 41 says. That's when they left Egypt. That's when the Exodus occurred. It was a promise to Abraham. Not to you, not to me, but to him. We inherit something of him. Christ was the ultimate son promised to Abraham. Christ paid on the cross. We inherit from Christ, not due to us. 
Now, why did God make that promise? Because he wanted to create a nation that would have the law so it would be an example and a blessing to all the other nations. And eventually, because that people would be the genetic bloodline of the Christ who would pay for all the sins of mankind. Those are promises that other people, namely Christ and Abraham, and a few along the way, like David, Moses, those are promises made to people, not us. We inherit through them. Israel lost the right of inheritance when she asked for a human king. So God grafted in David. Then he made the promise that Israel was supposed to get, go through David, that's 2 Samuel 7. And we see the loss of it in um, 2 Samuel, I forget what chapter... The first Samuel, I want to say it's like after chapter 13 somewhere. You know, because Saul ended up becoming king. Because Israel rejected God as king. It might be 1 Samuel 7, 1 Samuel 13, somewhere in that vicinity. 1 Samuel 9, maybe a little bit later. Are you beginning to understand this? The wider picture is not who we are, and we're not good because we're the sons of Abraham one way or another. So we got to get off the stupid fixation. Oh, I'm a, oh, I'm a Jew. I'm better than you cuz I'm a Jew. I'm the chosen people. Yeah, you are, but you're not doing what Jesus what Jesus said and you're not doing what Abraham did. So the promise to you only goes so far as that your hide will be protected. And of course, if you insist on being negative, well, then you even lose that. Meanwhile, anybody who persecutes you will also get persecuted. That's part of, you know, the promise in Genesis 12. So, because the Jews were apostate, a Hitler happened. But then Hitler and all the people like him got persecuted too. Same thing has happened under Nebuchadnezzar. The same idea, same promise, same outcome. But it's not because you're better. So if you're a Jew, there's a promise to you, people are not supposed to mess with you, and a Christian who actually loves God will not. But don't you get pig-headed. Deuteronomy 6 and 30. And we Christians aren't supposed to get pig-headed because we're sons of Abraham, as it were, by faith. That's Romans 11. Romans 9 through 11. It's really pitiful that Jews think, oh, we're Jews and we observe the uh, Mosaic law after believing in Yeshua HaMashiach. No, you don't. The law changed. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. You're spitting on Messiah if you keep observing the Old Testament law. But that's your problem. God will just spank you and he'll, you'll figure that out. And if you're all busy saying, Oh, I'm a Christian and, and we replace the Jews. Well, God will spit on you too because you're spitting on Christ. you got to understand something. This is bigger than us. This is, it is so disgustingly petty. To talk about whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. That's what the book of Galatians was dedicated against. Oh, I'm a Jew. Oh, I'm a Gentile. Oh, we take over the Jews. Oh, I'm a Jew. We're the chosen people. You're sickening. You're disgusting. You hate God. And you ought to be just thrown out with the trash. That you could be so petty and not care about what God thinks. The bigger picture is what did God do to preserve the human race? What did God do to save the human race? It has absolutely nothing to do with your bloodline. It has everything to do with what Christ did on the cross. Now he is king of the Jews. There are and there is a promise that the Jews will last and will rule in the millennium under Christ as queen of the nations. And the Gentile nations will be ruled by us in church who got our crowns down here before the rapture happens. 
as sister nations protecting Israel from her enemies, which will be many, and it will be part of our job to police those enemies. Because Satan will be incarcerated, and then at the end he gets let out. But a lot of people are just enemies anyhow, without Satan's help. And that's what the thousand years in part will prove. But that is nothing compared to the overarching purpose and structure of this. Christ paid for the human race. He'd have to come from somebody. And Abraham was the guy who had enough faith that God could make that promise to. And Abraham was persecuted his whole life. God made that promise to him. And that's why Messiah could be born. And the promise was broken at our end by Israel when she wanted a human king. And so God grafted Israel out and grafted David in and made him a king of Israel so Israel could inherit through David. And we all inherit through the last David. Period. It has nothing to do with whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It has to do with whether you believe in Christ. That's what Romans 9 is telling you. Now, you can be all fixated on being Jewish if you want, but you will never grow above a five-year-old. You will always be crazy and stupid about what Scripture says, and you'll never be able to read it. And all of your Torah observance means absolutely nothing. You're a traitor to Messiah. You hate him. And you'll end your life in a complete failure. And the same thing if you all get all hung up on, Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm better than the Jews. The Jews are Christ killers. Yeah, well, you're going to be at the bottom of heaven's totem pole if you ever once believed in Christ. Otherwise, you're going to be in hell. So stop the fixation about whether or not you're Jewish. If you are, honey, you, your Jewishness means absolutely nothing. Did you believe in Messiah? If you didn't, well, too bad. God will protect your hide while you're down here because of a promise he made to somebody else. Abraham. It has nothing to do with you and all your Torah observance means absolutely nothing. Because you didn't do what Abraham did. Genesis 15.6 And, on the other hand, if you're all hung up on being Christian, well, you're not a Christian. Even if you believed in Christ and are saved, you're not a Christian if you're busy getting all fixated on the Jews. Because if you're a Christian, you should be fixated on Christ. Otherwise, you're petty, stupid, carnal, and you too will be at the bottom of heaven's totem pole, assuming that you once believed in Christ. Otherwise, you'll be in hell alongside all those Jews who never believed in Christ and rejected their heritage theme of Romans 9. And then you can all hate each other in hell together, shaking your fist all like God, and that will be the one thing you have in common. So who are you going to be fixated on? Jewishness? Or the king of the Jews who saved your soul? Peace out.